Hello, and welcome to the North Head Sanctuary Draft Concept webinar. My name is Raquel Boyd, and I'm your facilitator for today. I'd like to begin the session today by inviting Christian Hansen to deliver the acknowledgement of country. Christian. Um, my name is Christian, I'm a member of the Warrior Man, and I acknowledge from Camera Asia Country and also acknowledge the neighbors of Gaddick Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Now, before we go any further today, I would like to point out a few key aspects of the webinar. Firstly, all participants are muted, and the webinar is being recorded. If you do have any questions that arise during the session about the draft concept, you can enter those into the QA tab on the Zoom navigation toolbar. Time allowing, we would like to get to those questions today if we can. Now, the agenda for today will commence with a formal welcome from the Chair of the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust. We will then hear from our specialists about the North Head Sanctuary draft concept through presentations on the historical context, the guiding principle and the signature initiatives. Following that, we'll have a panel discussion where we'll hear some further insights from our specialists. And then finally, we'll look at the next steps and how you can have your say through the consultation process. We do have a number of online workshops available. We'll provide details toward the end of the session. And I do encourage you all to participate in those workshops when you can. Now, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Firstly, we have Joseph Carosi. Now, Joseph has been the chair of the Harbour Trust for three years and was a board member prior. He's a highly respected business leader with over 30 years of experience leading professional services firms, most recently as managing partner of PwC. Joseph now commits to uh, not-for-profit and uh, a public boards, as well as being a strategic advisor to a number of businesses. We have Joe Ages. Joe is the design director of Cox Architecture. Some of his current and recent projects include the Sir John Monash Centre at the Australian National Memorial and the Australian Museum, which was recently completed in 2020. We have Christian Hampson. Christian is the CEO and co-founder of Yerubingen. He has an extensive background in Indigenous cultural heritage management and a passion for great design and promoting Indigenous narratives across the Australian landscape. And we have Hector Abrahams. Hector is the principal at Hector Abrahams Architects. Hector has worked on a range of large and small buildings in and around Sydney, regional New South Wales, Canberra, Brisbane, and New Zealand. Hector's area of expertise includes adaptation of historic buildings, new buildings in the context of historic and heritage buildings, conservation planning, and cultural landscape assessment. I now invite Joseph Carosi, Chair of the Harbour Trust, to formally welcome you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, welcome to everyone who is either joining now or will be looking at this uh, as, a, uh, as a recorded item. A really exciting and important time for us at the Harbour Trust. As you all know, um, our stewardship role over the last 20 years for some pretty special defence lands is what drives us to keep these sites open, accessible, and valuable to the contemporary users of our sites. They may have been defence sites. That's been a positive in terms of the defence history of the sites, but also the sites have retained their raw character and are able to be now used for the benefit of today's community and tomorrow's. So long as we respect the important historical significance the significance of these sites. Um, the answer to what we're trying to do today is not going to be a sales effort from the trust on something we've prepared earlier. This is genuinely a partnership with experts in the field that we've assembled for, for uh, North Head Sanctuary and also for Cockatoo Island, as I'm sure you, you agree. Um, but not just experts in the respective fields that are relevant to these sites, but we also want a partnership with the community. The ultimate use of these sites, according to our legislation, is that they respect, preserve and interpret the history of the sites. And we want to make sure that that interpretation is for the benefit of the community today and tomorrow. So your contribution to 
providing feedback, engagement, and participating in, the, in, in forums like this is really, really critical. Uh, our challenge is to take the concept plans, which we, we believe are a faithful representation of the significance of the site, but then embed into those the feedback received from the community so that we're able then to finalise a proposal which then will be submitted for, for funding and for activation with federal government, who are, um, who are our shareholders, but also state and local government as well, because these lands uh, don't have federated boundaries. They are lands for all Australians and every element of our, of our governing system needs to be uh, a part and parcel of the solution. So I'm really pleased that we've been able to put this together for our communities. Uh, this is one opportunity to provide feedback. There will be others and good ideas are always welcome 24 seven. So thank you for being part of this and I hope it's a productive uh, exercise this morning. Thank you very much, Joseph. So I now welcome Hector Abrahams to share with us the historical context that has led to the direction of the draft concept. Hector. Thank you. Good morning. Um, well, speaking of boundaries, North Head has natural boundaries. Um, the images in front of you are um, basically survey images from the first half of the 19th century. Um, it's always been a prominent place, um, an elevated place, and a remote place that has been accessible. Uh, there's a very long history and good evidence for um, high Aboriginal use of the site as a health site particularly, uh, but also as a site of, of specific flora and fauna and maritime life. Um, you can see from an early time, the sketch in the top left-hand corner is Thomas Mitchell's survey of the 1840s, that the, that the, the colonisers were very interested in the site and made sure it was never alienated um, to free settlement and control for the whole time, which is really why we're talking about it now. It's a site we all know very well. Um, so there's Mitchell surveying the site. And artists were captivated by its rugged character, high to the ocean, low to the harbour. And one of the early landscape photographs in Australia is the bottom left, and very much on the horizon there, you see a little speck. That's the isolated North Head. Um, that basic character of North Head, um, geological, isolated, dramatic, useful, um, has led to a, a long array of of uses on the site, health, quarantine, sewerage, hospital, some public access, and of course, military access. The isolated nature seen in this second page where you're seeing Manly and the bush beyond, and then you're seeing the real um, mammoth infrastructure to defend Australia in the Second World War, the gun emplacements, the North Fort, and um, the military barracks, which became the school of barracks. One of the most important um, military architectures um, really in the whole country. Great. Thank you so much, Hector. I'd now like to uh, invite <clears throat> Christian Hansen to speak to us about the guiding principle of the draft concept. Christian. Thank you. Um, I think the amazing thing that first struck us about North Head is, you know, that history that started with how the local community would purchase that place. It wasn't just the local community. North Head's known as Karangal and that is a connection to people travelling to that place for a, for a connection or um, the ability to be regenerated and, and, and essentially heal. So we looked at this concept of healing country as being a guiding principle for the site and I think that it's not just something that we want to have uh, regenerated from a First Nations view but actually something that all people can enjoy about the site and probably do enjoy about the site now. So the concept of healing country was a guiding principle that we worked together as a team to think about how the design itself could support the opportunity for people to, to connect to that place, but also then share in the narrative about how that place was previously used as a way to inspire how it could be used for the future. So I think that's sort of a good way to describe it, the guiding principle uh, for the next slide. So then we talked about this renewal of, of, of the site um, and that how people could come there, see 
what was there before, enjoy, understand the context of it. I think the design itself is, is looking towards a level of experience and feeling. And I mean, I always talk, we always talked about the opportunity to precisely interpret with that need for signage. The opportunity was that you could engage with the place through its form and experience and, and, and the architecture. So I think that's a tender game. That's something that we work together and trying to put across as a guiding principle. Uh, the opportunity to see multiple, um, multiple stories through time, be it the geological story, the, you know, the pre-contact story, post-contact and what's happened with military history in place all alongside each other in many cases weaved together rather than any separate stories, but an actual mosaic that on the side. So that's the, very much the approach we put forward in the Guardian Principles. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for explaining that. Um, we can now move then to Joe Ages, and Joe is going to show us the signature initiatives in the precincts on North End Sanctuary. Joe. Thank you. Um, so the first slide that you're looking at here really identifies two key precincts uh, within North Head, uh, the first being North Port and the other being the Barracks Precinct. And as you can see, there's a connection there implied between the two. And what isn't on that diagram, but is equally important is other connections. So this is not an isolated place, but pretty much a connected place to uh, the periphery uh, of the peninsula. Um, and also connected back to the sand pit of Manly and into Manly Beach and so forth. So making those connections is key. Uh, in, in terms of the two precincts that you're looking at, uh, they're both very different in their character. And the ideas that we've uh, developed around what to do with each of those are very much founded uh, on the issues that Christians just articulated and also a careful understanding of the more recent history and uses, particularly the military history that um, uh, Hector has articulated. So if we go to the next slide, so this is the North Port uh, precinct. And if we just run through um, what you're looking at here, so this is an aerial diagram of the site looking at it from the south. So imagine a drone over the harbour looking in a northerly direction. The first item there at the crest of the hill, as some of you will know, there's a slight inclination across this site moving from the south to the north. Uh, and at that north crest there is the idea for an interpretive centre. And we'll go into the detail of that in a moment, but essentially uh, an interpretive centre that is um, publicly accessible as a public space and interprets a range of things across the site, not least of which, of course, is the recent military history. The second item there is this idea for a native healing garden, uh, one that enables um, a meandering and a relaxed use of it by the broad public, and one that has potentially uh, an, an educative um, aspect to it uh, as well and tell stories of the recent past, but also you know, the much broader uh, uh, history of the place. Um, the third item there is reference to a car park. Again, as some of you may know, there is a car park on the site. It kind of does have a bit of an impact at the moment in the way it's configured. And the intention is to retain the number of cars, but to configure them in a better way to enable uh, better use of the land for the healing garden and other, uh, other ideas that we have for the place. Uh, the next item in there, number four, is the idea for a welcome place. One of the issues with North Port is that it's very much hidden from the public domain. As you're coming along the main scenic roadway, uh, you, you really, uh, unless you're a local and you're very familiar with the place, you really don't know that it's there. So, this welcome uh, structure, which may be an open pavilion, uh, signals that there's something there, gives identity to the place, may have a, a visitor information function, may have an indigenous welcome function, but starts to articulate and give presence to the North Port uh, as a precinct. Uh, and then the final uh, item there is this idea for an, an environmental education centre. Uh, and there is an existing building there that uh, doesn't have a use ascribed to it yet at the moment, uh, but potentially uh, it could be a centre for in education on environment, both uh, Indigenous uh, issues in regard to environment, but also 
you know, more, re more recent and perhaps more scientific uh, approaches to environment. And of course, it will have an engagement to the healing garden that we've spoken about. And indeed, there is one other item there, which is, uh, of course, the walking trails around the remnant um, uh, military history and also the memorial trail. And indeed, the, 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 the idea is for this healing garden with its various walking trails to engage this as well as the broader uh, pathways that we mentioned earlier. We move to the next slide. So firstly, if we just speak for a moment about the interpretive center, of course, as I mentioned, it's uh, on the crest of the hill. It will be of an architecture that speaks of place and that will be informed by indigenous thinking and understanding of place. It'll act in a sense as a beacon uh, at the top of the hill when you approach. And as you can see in the image on the left there, uh, it sits within this broader context of this healing garden. So there'll be a meandering walk through this garden up the hill to this uh, interpretive center. As I said, it will interpret a whole range of things, but probably principally around the more recent uh, military history and uses of the site. And the intention is to use a whole range of uh, methods of interpretation and communication as illustrated in the images on the right that involve uh, uh, contemporary digital uh, technology uh, that may involve uh, in, in an immersive space that would potentially involve uh, video and sound, etc. cetera, uh, but also enabling um, you know, the reality of real found objects, etc. cetera. Uh, and, and also the opportunity is here for it to physically engage uh, the tunnel system that's uh, on the site at the moment and the real kind of present heritage that's there in a really direct and profound way. We move to the next slide. Uh, the welcome place that I mentioned earlier, this is merely an indicative sketch of what it may be. And what the sketch tries to illustrate is uh, a, a roof form that um, is open. So you can see the remnant stone wall that's there at the entry, that the actual approach may be improved. At the moment, there's a bitumen roadway. Uh, the intention is to create something that's a bit more amenable to uh, pedestrian movement, and also to deal with some of the accessibility challenges that are there at the moment for people that are less able, and indeed those that may be wheelchair bound. Um, and the environmental education space, as I mentioned, is a reworking of an interior to an existing building uh, that would be uh, focused around education on environment, particularly environment here uh, at uh, North Head, but also a broader environmental education around uh, Indigenous uh, land management and land care, but also kind of cutting edge uh, science in terms of what's happening uh, locally and globally. And I understand there's the potential for Manly Council to kind of be actively engaged with this. It will, as I said, be an interior experience, but also one that really engages uh, the healing garden uh, just outside. Um, if we now go to the artillery barracks precinct, um, of course, this precinct will be linked back to Northport. So we want to encourage pedestrian movement around um, the whole of the peninsula. And going through the items that you can see on the screen at the moment, there's the idea for a, a reworked entry to this particular precinct. It does have a gatehouse building that functioned as a gatehouse when it was in military use. And the intention here is to certainly reintroduce some of those ideas, particularly when there may be a large event uh, occurring uh, on the parade ground, which brings me to item two, the parade ground itself. We want to preserve and acknowledge the military history and the importance of that as a gathering space, but we also want to potentially explore how we can uh, use it for community events and functions, and they may range from uh, a simple Sunday morning markets or a, a musical recital or a cinematic experience in the evening. So there's a whole range of potential. Uh, for the use of that space with the light touch, so we don't change it from, you know, the, the important uh, uh, historic uh, aspect to it uh, into something that really does engage and uh, um, invite public involvement. There is uh, Building One, which 
uh, sits idle at the moment, but there's a whole range of potential for it. Primarily, um, the consideration is that the uses need to and must be consistent with the heritage fabric. So primarily, we want to rejuvenate that brick building. We want to heal it, uh, bring it back to uh, its former glory, in a sense, uh, and then ascribe to it a range of potential uses. They could be, uh, they could be small scale commercial, they could be um, uh, function or convention. There may be some forms of temporary accommodation that are consistent with retaining the uh, and rejuvenating the original heritage of that building. And then, of course, there are other heritage buildings there as well that might be uh, uh, subject to the same kind of rejuvenation. The landscape around this precinct uh, could be improved as well uh, through strategic um, introduction of uh, appropriate uh, new planting and ensuring that uh, you know what's endemic in terms of the planting there is sort of improved and um, and healed. Uh, moving to the next slide, uh, again, this is a, a simple image of um, people enjoying that parade ground. As I said, the intention is to retain the quality of a space as a historic space and so referencing its former military uses. And the idea is that uh, these public event uh, uses of that space would be of a light touch, so as not to impact um, uh, the heritage that's there at the moment. Next. And of course, Building One has a whole range of incredible interior spaces. Interestingly, for those of you that have been inside, a lot of the detailing, be it um, uh, uh, door hardware or balustrades or lighting, et cetera, they're all intact. So it's not just the exterior shell of this building, but the interiors that we really need to care for and preserve and heal. Uh, uh, the image that you're looking at there is um, uh, or what was the mess hall when it was in military use. And it would be a great space to use for, again, a similar type of use, uh, be it uh, a, you know, a, a dining space or a conference space or something that speaks to its former use but rejuvenated and made useful for, for today and into the future. Uh, next, I think that may be, that may be it. So I think that may be it. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you so much uh, for taking us through those. So we are now at the point in the session today where we are going to have a bit of a panel discussion. I'm going to post some questions to the panel so that we can uh, hear some more from them and gain some further insights into the development of the draft concept. Now, Joe, you're not off the hook straight away. I'm going to go to you first. Um, and you've, you've talked a little bit about this in what you were just uh, taking us through, but I'd love to hear some more around this from you. What does the guiding principle, Gilly Country, mean to you and your interpretation in these designs? A good question. I think fundamentally uh, it's about acknowledging First Nations peoples. Yes. Um, and in, in whatever we do, being informed by that across all decisions uh, on the site. So that's number one. I think secondly is around environment and landscape. Um, there's a lot, a lot that can be done uh, beyond the healing garden, but it's an inclusive of it to rejuvenate, heal, and improve the, the landscape that's there. I think in terms of the um, heritage buildings, the restoration and rejuvenation of them, in a sense, is a healing process in itself. And I think um, finally, for those that visit the site, um, no, it should be an uplifting experience. Uh, it should be an educative experience. And fundamentally, uh, uh, together with all of that, it should be a healing, healing experience. So we want it to be a positive place for you know, all visitors uh, to come and they engage with them. Great. Thank you very much, Joe. Now, my next question is for Joseph. We've talked a lot uh, over the last few moments around the two signature initiatives in North Port and the artillery barracks. What about the rest of the site? Yeah, good, good question. It, when we look at a site as vast as North Head, and we focus on the areas that we will activate or, or change or rehabilitate, your mind's eye might be drawn to the fact that is this the way the site will look 
in its totality. The reality of it, though, is that this is called a sanctuary for a very important reason. We're talking about 150 hectares in total, half of which is under the domain of the uh, Harbour Trust, and another half of which is within, within the domain of the state government through national parks and wildlife. That sense of sanctuary, serenity, healing, um, and, um, and, a, and, a res and a respite from our urban landmarks, if you like, will not change. So the North Fort uh, installation interpretation, which I think is going to be so special, um, the, the, the garden and the military actually is a healing in and of itself. You know, we don't do um, truth telling well in this country. And this exercise, from a personal perspective, having worked with, with Christian, Joe and Hector and others, um, you learn a hell of a lot just by asking questions on what was here, what makes sense, who do we talk to, to make sure that our views are authentic. So this overall engagement, not just with the Harbour Trust, but with the community, I think will be a source of great education. So whilst we're focusing on the the, the uh, North Fort installation, for example, which I think could be as spectacular as the Villers uh, Bretonneux mm -hmm. site in, in France, yes. but a lot more accessible to our locals. Um, or the reopening of the, of the, bar the military school, the, the artillery school, the barracks for community purposes. Whilst we're focusing a lot on those and the garden, the vastness of the site will remain, the personality of the site will remain as a sanctuary, and the very special flora and fauna that is there will be cared for as it is um, today. Great. Thank you very much for those thoughts, Joseph. Now, Christian, we've heard uh, you talk about First Nation knowledge and how that can be embraced through collaborative design. How can we ensure that that's achieved in this process? Um, I think normally, you know, the discussions that happen with First Nations people about these types of projects can often be all around engagement and consultation. But in this instance, I think the concepts that are presented are there to firstly engage, you know, them in the option yeah. side. And I think co-design is something that my company came across as, you know, really about a, an empathy approach to design, signing with people. And I think the great thing about that is then, a place can have so many opportunities for a community fingerprints to be on those sites. Uh, sometimes design can forget who it's designing for. And I think the, the great thing about co-design, and particularly with First Nations people, is having narrative in that place that, um, as Joseph and Joe said, you know, these questions that people would like to ask and the opportunity to engage with an understanding of something local, but then also feel that there's a, a new story being written as well on the site. So there's this, that idea of co-design is very much about that. And I think it's as much about what will happen at the site once it is, is, is completed as much as what, it, what the site will look like towards that screen co-design. So I think, although there are concepts concepts there, there is a lot of space for multiple artists to be really engaged in that space. You know, some people see space as spatially from, an, from a First Nation point of view. Others see it as a way of sharing a story, and, and both of those combinations lend themselves very well to, to design and in places like this. I mean, the idea of this sanctuary is, is amazing, and, and I think in this time, you know, time of our um, century and the things that have happened over the last year or so, I think people seeking places like this is very important, and the yeah. opportunity to share and celebrate them is extremely important. Yeah. Absolutely. Just what? Just one of the examples of that. The the. Um, First Nations bush management techniques. Yes. Now we've just gone through a violent bushfire season, um, and there's been there was one in North North End oh, indeed yeah. as well. That the great work from Australian Wildlife Conservancy is uh, is helping to rehabilitate the, uh, the native species of plants and um, animals on the site. But what great opportunity exists for the in, you know, for entrusting that site so that we all learn about the First Nations bush management techniques. What does it involve? How does it work? Does it work in today's environment? That education process for our community 
would be such a special way of bringing the First Nations history in a contemporary context and, and one that is real. You'll be able to go there and experience it, be part of it. Be quite and, immersed in that. Be, absolutely. Yeah. So, so it's, it's a really special opportunity to bring all of that together. Thank you. Thank you both for your thoughts on that. Absolutely. I think it is, I think we are definitely um, speaking a lot about how special the place is and that sanctuary actually is a really very apt name yeah. for the place that we're speaking of today. Now, Hector, I have a question for yourself. Given the complex and layered history of North Head Sanctuary, what are the key things that you've considered in looking at these designs? Firstly, we asked us to consider North Head as a whole, and I right. just mentioned that. Um, we asked them to um, consider, we asked Joe and the team to consider that those, what you call complex layers, mm -hmm. are, are, are um, what people did on the site, and they all went there because of certain fundamental aspects of the site, its isolation and its accessibility those two together. Um, and that kind of helped um, understand or get more comfortable with a history that looks like a history of conflict. And it is a history of conflict. Yeah, People had to argue very hard to yeah. yell out on the side at the time. We fired guns from the side. Um, but by using that simple um, attitude to the side, who's been there? What have they been doing there? How did they get there? Um, that's enabled the, the connection with the historical um, uh, the historical reality of the site. Um, so that, like the word you used, bring, it's a site where people always bring themselves to and bring plans to and bring intentions to. That's, and it's no mistake, therefore, the site is a stewarded site today in National Parks and the Trust. They steward this thing and, and, and bringing the guests access and just having this webinar is about bringing something to the site. So that's how we talk about it. It's a cultural landscape perspective. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I will check if we have some questions from the webinar. Thank you. Lots. We have a few there. There was quite a large, a large part. Here we go. All right. So let's start with, hmm, what are the hurdles to complete the plan? Me? Oh, I think so. Okay. Oh, there's a few sub questions there. Let me put this in. When's it going to go ahead? Is it funded? So yeah, perhaps that can give you a bit more framing to that question of good question. hurdles. Mm. So the, the, the hurdles, I suppose, and the funding are sort of related, although it's not all about funding, to be frank. Good ideas tend to be funded more easily and more yes. quickly yes. than contested ideas. So the community feedback on this is really important. Yes. Um, this is not about a, a funding exercise today. What this is about is what the right interpretation of the site is. That really speaks to the community's heart and head in terms of how it works. If we don't achieve that, then having funding in the bank ain't going to cut it. Okay. So we need to get this right. That's our first opportunity to, to bring the right use, the right expression, and the right timeline for this for this wonderful site. Yes. The second issue, which is a hurdle, is that at the moment the site is under a deed of arrangement with the state government, yeah. and we have been working with the state government through Minister Stokes and the planning and place making team. And kudos to the state government for actually calling a ministry, the minister, a ministry for places that doesn't exist anywhere else in the country, and it speaks to the importance of places, not commercial sites, but places of sanctuary, of, of, of uh, community, of amenity. Yes. So we've been working with the state government on that, uh, on, on how we can work together. Um, so one aspect from the state government is that they should be prepared, hopefully, to give us a much longer lease over this site in exchange for the fact that we are going to invest Commonwealth funds to activate and interpret and make the site accessible. So there's a win-win for both arms of government and how good would that be to bring both, uh, both federal and state governments together. The third element, uh, which is a hurdle, a hurdle because of the geography, 
we want to make sure that Northern Beaches Council is open and supportive and welcoming as well. The Environmental and Education Centre is a very key um, ambition that we've heard from the Northern Beaches Council, and they've been very supportive of this process as well. And what we want Northern Beaches Council to do is to help us in terms of access. Um, you know, we don't want the, the character of the broader area, the, the peninsula, Manly, is that the hospital's being closed down and it's going to be repurposed. How can council help to make the site more accessible, better known, and not negatively impact the broader community that they have ultimate responsibility for in terms of their daily life and needs as well? So if you call them hurdles, that's maybe one way of saying it, but they are they are next pieces in 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 the in the, in the process. Yes. The funding will be an outcome of that. If okay. we can present a plan that has community support, is the right uh, interpretation of the site under our legislation. State and federal governments are standing behind its uh, the, the, the delivery of that vision as well. Then we'll we will then we will be able to go to the federal government. Uh, later in the year to seek funding for that. And although we're an aid, we're a, a, a trust or an authority of the federal government, um, there hasn't been committed funding for this purpose yet. There's been an independent report that was commissioned by the federal government that talked about fresh vision for Cockatoo and for North Head Sanctuary. That's what we're doing. And then we'll go to the federal government to talk about priority funding cost benefit to the, to the nation because it's the national uh, government, not just the local Sydney side um, amenity. Uh, but I'm confident that if we have the, the other hurdles sorted, mm. we'll be in a much better position in speaking with our minister, um, Susan Lee, mm. and, and the federal government more generally on a very special site. Great. Thank you, Joseph. Actually, what you articulated in explaining hurdles really sounded like opportunities yeah. that are coming along along the that's way. How, that's how I prefer to look at them. Yeah, it definitely sounded that way. Okay, Hector, I'm going to direct this one to yourself. I hope that you are the person who can answer this question. Will the military history be preserved and will the military equipment that was once on the site be returned? Yeah, that's a great question. Oh, maybe Joseph wants to jump in on that one. <laughs> Well, as Joe said before, the attitude to the <coughs> to the artillery school is a light touch attitude, right. and that he rather artistically talked about the healing. Um, so the attitude to the that largest part of the military um, fabric of the site is is one of um, conservation and respect, and um, and putting it to right order. That also applies uh, to the perhaps the more significant in the military sense, the gun emplacements themselves um, and the strategic alignment of tunnels to enable um, a defensive attitude to be maintained at a high intensity over the, over the war, um, which is a remarkable achievement. Um, yeah. um, and Joe, was, Joe said that is going to be a focus of the interpretation. Okay. Um, we don't have the great guns, they were taken away 50 years ago. Right. Um, I'm not aware of the trusts understanding what collections mm. there are of ephemera for the site, but the advice is to um, those any ephemera of the site would be um, the first thing that the interior team would want to put on the site. Right. Um, um, there are military groups who are very aware of the site. Um, and, and who are active in their history making of the site, the historical research of the site, we're aware of those. Uh, so we're not just focused, we wouldn't, our advice would not just focus on, on um, physical things, but also the people and their, their um, oral history and their social history of the site, which is really important. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you, Hector. Did you have anything else to add? Just no, I think, I think it summarised it well. Yeah. Lovely. Okay, our next question. Uh, this one might be for yourself as well, Joseph. Let's see how we go. Will the Environmental Centre be leased or operated by the Harbour Trust? Good question. I don't, I don't think we've resolved how that's going to look. Right. But one of the discussions that we, that we had uh, earlier, and Christian mentioned it, this, this idea of 
caring for country, how did how these our first nations peoples um, use the, 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 the special, you know, the, I think from a from an indigenous perspective, that it, it was a site for medicine men and women healers. What does that mean? And what was it about the site that made that a reality? Was it the special um, its location, the special species of plants, animals? What was it there? So we want to make sure that the, the Education and Environmental Centre actually is an authentic representation of that. Yes. If that means having that site leased to an institution who can bring that to life, uh, so be it. Uh, if, if it means having it leased to a Northern Beaches Council or a not-for-profit, so be it. The, the, I mean, I, I sort of, in the back of my mind, Northhead is almost a social dividend for the community. So this is not about leases or commercial return. And I might sound unlike my history in saying that, but there are certain, there's a time and a place for everything. Yes. The leases and the commercial activation on North Head, potentially at the, um, at the Royal Artillery School mm -hmm. or some of the other buildings that are currently leased, there's a childcare leasing, there's food and beverage, which I think is community as much as, yes. as commercial. Those sort of things are important, obviously, but they, will, they won't change the personality of the site and, and the education and, and environmental centre uh, is, is along those lines as well. So we haven't landed on who will operate it and uh, in what circumstances. Is it, is it free or ticketed or does it vary? That's down the track, but let's get the concept right and then the, the uh, execution of that will, will, will answer those questions. Great, thank you. Now, the next one I think is also for yourself, Joseph. It's a question about the previous consultation that was done, the Hello Lamp Post yeah. consultation. The question is, how did that contribute to the plans that we've seen today? Great, yeah, th thank you. Good question. The Hello Lamp Post has been a, a, um, a really useful way of getting people engaged to yes. provide ideas. Um, you know, we do lots of, we, we receive lots of information on the trust through, through our web, web um, website or through correspondence. Mm -hmm. Hello Lamp Post is a digital way of, of feedback. So yes. the, the, um, the concept plans that, that, you, that have now been drawn up uh, and, and from, from Hector, Christian and Joe have been informed by feedback from the Hello Lamp Post examples and other, and other material from the community. So we're trying to, to bring to a, a form what the community has told us to date. So this is not a sort of a group of advisors in a room thinking what would be good for the site. It is based on community input. Now we're putting that into a format that can help the community react and say, yeah, that's exactly what we meant, or what about this? And indeed provide us with more feedback through this consultation yep. process yep. Uh, and the workshops and surveys that I'll give you the details of before yep. we finish today. Thank you very much, Joseph. Um, okay, now this question, um, I'm going to put it to the panel, and whoever would like to answer, please do. What are the activation strategies for attracting more visitors to the site? Hmm. Um, I, perhaps I should start off on that one. Please do, Joe. I, I think um, there are a few, a few things there in the mix that will be definitely destinational. Okay. Uh, so clearly on the North Port site, mm -hmm. the interpretive centre, Yes. Uh, if it's executed the way we have imagined and the way the Harbour Trust has sort of envisaged, uh, it, it will become a strongly destinational place to visit. Um, that, that would have, uh, in, in a sense, as Joseph articulated, you know, potentially Sydney-wide, but also uh, you know, national significance. So that obviously is going to draw people yes. uh, and that creates opportunities and issues that obviously we need to think through. Um, on the, uh, on the uh, artillery barracks site, obviously the idea of the parade ground as an event space, yes. obviously different in that it's temporary and intermittent, but uh, depending on the event, um, it, it should be destinational as well, whether yes. it's um, mainly locals, as I said earlier, going to a Sunday market as a destination, yes. uh, it will draw people into the site, or whether it's a uh, you know, a, a music recital or, or a cinematic experience that, you know, might have appeal certainly to local community, but possibly, you know, more broadly uh, across the Northern Beaches or indeed uh, Sydney. So 
there will be attractors and there will be destinations in the mix that will uh, draw people through. But then, of course, all the other uses um, potentially will benefit for that from that, um, and it will be supported by the food and beverage offers and other mm -hmm. offers there. Mm -hmm. I, I, I certainly think the um, that the, the North Fort installation, as as Joe mentioned right at the beginning, it, it's not well signposted, it's not well yes. known, and it's closed most of the time. Yeah. I mean, there are formal tours that happen, but having been through through those, so there's 300 meters of a very well preserved tunnel space, and within the tunnel there's a there's a um, uh, power room that, that sort of you know that have generators and the like great military tunnels connecting to the to the gun emplacements as well um, that's a story waiting to be told you know it was the scene of first contact there was a scene of wartime contact as Hector mentioned as well um, we don't have many authentic real sites in Sydney to tell that story and so I think that site respectfully done will be a major attractor of hopefully school kids and groups and visitors to, to get a real sense of, of the site. And But the reason for having these attractors on sites like this is so that by coming for a particular purpose, a market on a weekend or a, yes. or is, or a or the North Fort um, educational experience or the, or the immersive experience, you also then realise that there is 150 hectares of urban bushland that is incredibly therapeutic for, for us as peoples. There aren't too many examples of that either. And so I think the, the attracting people in to get that broader experience is what this, this site's all about. It's not about attracting them in to get their commercial revenue or attracting, attracting them in to participate in, in sort of activities. It's also attracting them in so that that part of Sydney and the significance of the site gives them a chance to come back mm -hmm. and meander and learn and, and be enriched by what is a pretty special place. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. Okay, the next question that I have is, aren't there opportunities for native wildlife regeneration? For example, koala habitats uh, and reintroduction of species flora and fauna. Any thoughts on that? I think um, from a cultural resource perspective, I mean, a, a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Chelsea Mar Marshall, talked about it's called the biocultural lens. You know, okay. that, you know, science and culture for us is is not separated. You know, we're, we're the first scientists. You know, we yes. we we environmentally environment, manage our landscapes, and, and so I think the opportunity to enrich the endemic landscape there, in particular. Probably connects also to the activation the opportunity to, to be able to collect seed from the site and expand it and have the yeah. site replenished as yeah. an educational resource, as an activation resource. Yeah. But I think also as something that would not just happen on the site, but it's hopefully um, inspire people to take those types of species and have them in yard yeah. and have them out and sort of essentially have, have it reach out. I think it's a great opportunity. So I know we had talked early on that there's a possibility about how. That can happen, it's happened on other sides of First Nations communities where there's been you know, native nurseries that are established as part of the education role, exactly. as part of the generation role exactly. on the side. Yes. So I think yeah. um, definitely, and then obviously that would then support the endemic ecology for the side. So I think that's, that's a very big opportunity for the side. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, but actually, I'll just check if there aren't any more that have popped in. Okay, I have got one here. Here we go. Thank you. Okay. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. So this question is coming from one of the people that are on the webinar right now, and they've said that they love the idea of a community space for events like the markets and things that yeah. we have spoken about. But how can we ensure that it remains sympathetic to history? Yeah. How will you prepare for things like parking and public transport, things like that? Yeah, sure. Um, good question. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, um, you know, as we said, sort of acknowledging uh, the heritage of the place and ensuring what we do with it 
um, retains and respects that heritage is, is key. And certainly, if that's the fundamental and the approach, then the curation and the organization of events uh, on the parade ground obviously needs to be consistent with that. Um, in, in terms of uh, the logistics of bringing people in and out, we mentioned uh, the use of the uh, gate house building for that purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, so obviously, uh, in, in some instances, when you do have a large event, you need to bring a large group of people in and then have them disperse in, a, in an orderly and a safe manner. Uh, so that will require a logistics overlay to the place and the way that we organise that. Of course, public transport um, is an important issue. That there is public transport to the site at the moment. And indeed, um, as with other events around Sydney, there may be additional services when there is uh, an event. And then, of course, all of that's got to be organised and managed, but it's all very much possible. Uh, and indeed, um, uh, car parking is an issue uh, as well. There's significant, reasonably significant car parking on the site at the moment. It's not terribly well organised. It does have an impact on uh, the landscape and certainly the experience of the place. So organising the parking uh, in a better way to enrich the landscape. So you, uh, you know, you, you're engaging with landscape as opposed to tarmac, tarmac and bitumen is yeah. an issue. Yeah. Um, there's things like spill car parking. So there may be designated areas that um, are, are permeable. Uh, that are generally, for the most part of the, the, the week or the year, are effectively landscaped open spaces, but for an event, maybe additional car parking. Well, all of these issues are very much possible, okay. and certainly, uh, you know, issues that we uh, that we can work through, even through you know the logistics of uh, sound and power, etc., within uh, the the parade ground itself. Again, there are very uh, there are very good, simple ways to bring that infrastructure in, conduct the event, and then remove it without impacting the heritage fabric. Nice. Okay, great. Right, thank you. And we, and we do um, transport and traffic studies, and we've, okay. we've done them on other sites yes. where we're considering changes as well. But nice. One of the things about North Edge, Joe, the point you made is really um, impactful for me because as you're driving around the site, in some respects, the car parks are an, are an obvious landmark, which means the site hasn't been well designed. Yeah. Now, maybe for military use, that was okay, yeah. because it's not wasn't about the you know um, the historic or the, the educational role. It was a it was an installation. Yeah. But the relocation or the you know the, the making the car parking area more sensitive and sympathetic to the site is something we need to think about. The impact to the surrounding neighbourhood and residents, that's why we want the Northern Beaches Council on board and we'll look at traffic studies and, and the like as well. Thank you. Good, uh, good questions. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you both. Okay, we have time for one last question. So I'll pose this to the panel. Are there any plans for the third quarantine cemetery? On the site? I'll leave can't remember off offhand, but I, I know there is a memorial walk that you mentioned behind the the, um, the North Fort area, and the the, the quarantine cemetery is uh, does need to be um, more prominently highlighted and interpreted as well. Um, offhand, I can't I can't recall what what is in these concepts for the yeah, there, the there, there is it sits adjacent to the North Fort precinct, yeah. and I think as we mentioned. Uh, earlier on, creating other than identifying and rejuvenating these precincts, creating connections, yes. principally pedestrian connections yes. uh, between the two, but then more broadly uh, around the whole of the peninsula is important. Um, there is the opportunity to really improve and make more legible that connection yes. from North Fort uh, uh, to this quarantine cemetery. Yes. Uh, I think there are again some challenges around accessibility yes. because you have to climb up a you know, reasonably difficult incline for someone that might be um, uh, certainly uh, uh, challenged, uh, an elderly person or whatever in that regard. So we can improve all of that, but there's certainly the opportunity and it, 
you know, and it should occur because it does tell that fuller story of the place. And um, uh, uh, it's a really interesting symmetry. And from that symmetry, you have the most magnificent views of the harbour. Uh, so we really should be engaging with it, and that's the intent. Great. I think I'd just like to add that um, it's kind of obvious what Joe was saying that it gets it gets pulled into the interpretive strategy. Yes. That's strategically good because there's a whole lot of that ropes in the whole quarantine history of Northhead, which goes back to the 1820s and a bit earlier. Yeah. Um, also, what John said, you said earlier, Joseph, that, and you were just saying there, it's um, the, the third cemetery is, is, is a visceral place to visit. You know, the feel and the atmosphere of the third cemetery is um, extraordinary. It's like being on Norfolk Island. Yeah. And, wow. um, and I think that's probably an ambition I'd say or my ambition for the project <laughs> is that is that 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 visceral the feel of the place yes. you know, for all your strategies will, will will just draw people not only into it but but, but into it so there's yes. stronger connections. That's what happens at Villa's Revenue. Yeah. It has a feel, it has that sort of yes. that's that's really the ambition um, yeah. is, is yeah. that 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 people feel the place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not some kind of um you know, light show happening over there is it gets in, it gets inside. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, gentlemen. I'd like to thank all of you very much for your insights uh, through this morning uh, and especially through that last session. Okay, so finally, uh, let's take a look at the ways that you can have your say and be really actively involved in the consultation. So firstly, we have our virtual workshops happening. Now, these are planned from the 18th of May through to the 1st of June. They run for one hour each, and you can attend them from your own laptop. You can register for those on the Harbour Trust website. And I really encourage you to do so. It is a great opportunity for you to really immerse yourself in the consultation process and a great way for you to provide input and thoughts around things like the third quarantine cemetery that we were just talking about. So it's a very active way for you to participate. We also have community pop-up sessions, and these are scheduled for Northport, for the School of Artillery, for the Rocks, and the Manly Corso. And these will be happening from the 15th of May through to the 29th of May. And at these pop-up sessions, you can actually speak to a person face-to-face -face and find out more information about the draft concept. And we have an online survey, and we encourage everyone to complete this. It is a great way for you to provide us your valuable contribution to the consultation process. So the information on all of these activities is on the Harbour Trust website. I really do encourage you to please go there, explore the things that you can be involved in, and please get involved in the ways that suit you best. So as we conclude this webinar, I would very much like to thank our panellists, Joe Carosi. Joe Ages, Christian Hansen, and Hector Abrahams. And I'd like to thank you for your participation in this webinar on the Northhead Sanctuary Draft Concept. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>